So it gives me great pleasure in introducing today's speaker, Professor Matthias Kipping. Uh, Dr. Kipping is Professor of Policy and Richard War Chair in Business History at Schulich. In addition, he's the Academic Director of the Kellogg Schulich Executive MBA program. He has been trained as a historian with degrees from Savon in Paris, Ludwig Maximilians in Munich, and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He has held full-time and visiting positions at various universities around the world. Uh, he's a winner of, uh, a recent winner of the prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Award for his research bridging history and management studies. So today, Professor Kipping will be sharing his thoughts on what we can learn from history in coping with COVID-19. Welcome, Matthias, and it's all yours. So before I start, I want to put a disclaimer on. I usually do that before all of my classes because I speak very frankly when I speak. So first of all, important, I speak in my name only, not in the name of Schulich or York or anybody else, just me. Uh, I mean no disrespect to the people whose current leaders I might criticize, and I probably will criticize a few. Um, uh, I make a distinction between a country and the people and uh, those who govern it. Um, so, uh, as I said, no disrespect to the country or the people, and also no disrespect to those who have uh, lost a loved one to COVID. Um, when I use some cold statistics, because I will use some cold statistics, I do deplore every single person who died uh, because of COVID and even more uh, those who died because of uh, bad leadership. Um, uh, again, another important disclaimer, I'm not a historian of pandemics or of diseases. I, my historical research covers something else. So what I say about pandem pandemics uh, and uh, COVID is based on what I'm reading, uh, not on my own original research. But there is a particular historical view that I think uh, will help, or there's actually different historical views that will help understand the current pandemic uh, a little better. And so I've distinguished three different historical reviews uh, that I'll go through now. So there is the what actually happened and why history. That's really the bread and butter of what historians do. So if you wanted that, you know, what actually happened and why history, we'd have to do this again in about 30 years. And then I can tell you uh, you know, what happened, as much as the facts will become available and I can do critical research to unearth those facts. So, but that's not now. Then there is what you call the what if history or uh, more scientifically counterfactual history. And counterfactual history is, is a good tool because it allows you to better bring out why things happened the way they are by looking at the alternative that were alternatives that were available but didn't come to pass. So you could ask some very good uh, what if questions even now, but again, understanding that you know history took a different path. Uh, so what if the communist regime in China had not initially suppressed information about the outbreak and acted earlier? Uh, again, we don't know because uh, that didn't happen. They did suppress the information. Uh, my guess is, again, based on historical experience, the virus would have still spread around the world. Um, and the, you know, the West uh, would have probably still been slow to act on what uh, many thought was just a Chinese problem uh, at the outset. Um, so second what if question, what if Fox News and Twitter dude had not dismissed it so lightly at the outset, uh, at the beginning? Uh, well, again, um, there's good reasons why they did dismiss it and called it a hoax and you know, um, nothing but a, a common cold. Uh, but probably they would have been better prepared. And again, we would have seen a slightly, the, the virus would have spread and no travel ban could have stopped it either. Um, but maybe fewer people had, would have had to die. We don't know. Again, these are the what if questions. This is in general a problematic view. Uh, why? Because it pinpoints one particular person. It's usually what I call the great man view of history. One particular person and gives them a lot of power that really they don't have because they're part of structures. Uh, so there, I recently read an article about Woodrow Wilson, who was the president in the U.S. during World War One and at its end, um, coming down with the flu during the peace conference in Versailles in 1919. And the author argued that, well, he was weakened by the flu and couldn't impose a more peaceful or a different solution uh, for Europe uh, after the First World War. And that eventually, da-da-da-da-da, uh, you know, brought about World War Two. You know, it's not 
it's a chain of events. Uh, I think that's probably not right. It would have happened even if he had had not the flu because there were structural reasons and lots of other reasons that, you know, drove that to, um, you know, to happen. So again, you have to be very careful with the what if you because it promotes that idea that one person can change the course of history and usually they can. Uh, so my view of history and that the one I'll be talking about today is the what can we learn from history, history. So uh, history does not, that's important, uh, history does not repeat itself. Very clearly it does not. Um, Moshe Fajun, who gave a great talk in this series, like all the other talks, he already mentioned uh, something and he even said, you know, we want to learn about history, uh, join uh, the talk by Kipping. Uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Okay, what does that mean? That there's similar patterns repeating itself, just like in a poem. Um, and that, another point of history, is generally attributed, that saying is attributed to Mark Twain, but I looked that up and there is actually no historical evidence to suggest that it was him who said this. Um, so, but it's still attributed to him. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that yes, it does rhyme and we'll talk a little bit about rhyming today, but uh, the problem is people, and that's one of the frustrations when you're a historian is that people don't seem to like to read poetry, that don't look for the patterns or re don't remember the patterns that might help make more sense of what it is like uh, today. What are the things we can learn from history? Three of them. Uh, I'll start about you know the obvious one. What about pandemics? Well, pandemics are part of human history. Uh, and probably since humans exist, you will have had diseases that you know, affected humans and killed humans. And the first one that we have a historical record of, you know, a decent historical record of, is what's called the Plague of Justinian, who was the uh, emperor then of the Roman Empire, uh, the Plague of Justinian or Justinian's Plague. And it lasted for almost two centuries until it finally abated. We'll see how long you know, COVID lasts. That's not necessarily, uh, it won't, might not rhyme there. Uh, it started actually in what is today Egypt in 541, uh, and it reaches Britain, what is today Britain, within two years. So globalization, those who say, oh, globalization is to blame for pandemics, and if we just stop globalization or in, in, introduce travel bans, uh, then no pandemics will happen. Mm, history says no. It'll get you. It'll, you know, it took longer because transport was a little slower, but it'll get you. So um, don't think that travel bans help. Uh, you have had, you know, repeated recurrences of uh, the Black Death, and it ravages Europe's Europe, mainly Europe, but also other parts of the world. And a particular bad, uh, par, uh, you know, occurrence of the Black Death was. Uh, in the 14th century. I'm just referring to that picture. I'm not sure you can see this. Um, it's a mask that is often worn uh, during the carnival of uh, Venice, uh, a big mask. And it's, uh, this costume is called Il Medico della Peste, uh, the, the, the doctor, the medic of the, uh, the Black Death, uh, the plague. And it was actually apparently from medical historians telling us it was invented in the 17th century by a French doctor uh, to protect the, uh, the doctors uh, who would take care of people who had uh, the plague. So again, the issue of protective equipment is not a new one either. Second, and again, here's the cold statistics, uh, the COVID-19 death toll will probably been lower, uh, significantly lower than for past pandemic. Mentioned the Black Death. It, killed on average up to a third of the population. That's, you know, that's roughly, again, it varies. And we don't have good enough research to have, you know, clear statistics, but well, you know, a third is a good assumption. Worse happened actually when Europeans uh, went to the Americas, their diseases that they had developed immunity to uh, mostly, but that the indigenous population in the Americas didn't have immunity to because they hadn't been exposed to them. Uh, killed up to 90% of indigenous people. So the Europeans, um, you know, clearly, and it, I say wiped out because all of that happened in a very, very quick time because there was no immunity, no, vac no vaccines, nothing. And uh, the great influenza, which is now used to compare uh, this to, uh, was also a much, much bigger killer. Um, a much bigger killer it killed, again, because we don't have good research, and I'll explain that in my next slide, uh, the estimates go between 50 and 100 million people. If you bring that up to the population size today, today that would mean 210 to uh, 420 million, okay? So that's somewhere between close to three to 6% 
of global population if uh, COVID was as, would be as lethal as the great influenza was. And COVID again, called statistic, might not even reach the mortality of today's recurrent ongoing global disease. So we have a number of global diseases uh, that are ongoing every year. And uh, it probably has already reached, I mean, the numbers, the official numbers, I think are 250 or 60,000 dead uh, today, but there's a lot of under-reporting, a lot of you know, uh, uncertainty about the numbers. Probably we, we got to 400,000 already, probably. Um, and that's what malaria kills every year. And most of those uh, people killed by malaria are actually young children. And the World Health Organization estimates that we probably get uh, double the number of malaria deaths uh, uh, this year uh, because most of the resources and attention and money is uh, poured into COVID rather than in the, an ongoing disease like malaria. But again, um, and again, I'm a cynic here, but malaria is largely invisible to the global north because it takes place uh, to a large extent in Africa and, and other you know, regions of the global south. Uh, the biggest killer, uh, ongoing killer is tuberculosis. And that's actually largely preventable and partially treatable because we haven't done enough research on antibiotics because uh, it's become now uh, immune to that. Uh, it kills about 1.5 million people uh, per year. I don't think COVID will quite get there, but uh, let's see uh, how the US does now that it's reopening again. And Russia is also uh, counting uh, infections. It's going up uh, every day. So uh, maybe it'll, we'll still reach it. I doubt it. A uh, third important learning is quarantine has worked in the past. Um, and it's, you know, the word is actually an Italian word for 40 days. And it has worked during, you know, the Black Death and it has worked uh, during most uh, outbreaks. And there's some interesting research going on about the great influenza in the US, which shows that those cities that closed faster um, kept the death uh, toll low and uh, actually recovered faster as well. So uh, there is some research on that. Uh, let me move on to my second insight, is that history tells us that we rarely remember these diseases, uh, these pandemics. Um, we actually do remember things, but uh, selectively. So uh, we have a really bad historical memory. Uh, I asked my students in 2018 uh, what centennial it was, what uh, event we commemorated, and not a single one of them. And you know, I go through all the MBA classes every year. Um, teaching a history class, um, not a single one of them could remember the great influenza. Not a single one of them. Uh, some of them, you know, actually a good number remembered, obviously that it was the end of World War I, the armistice, especially Canadians, you know, understandable because it's an important part of our uh, heritage, of our nation building, of our identity as Canadians. So uh, we know more about that, and you know, we have symbols that remind us of it and events that remind us of it. And it's only now that people start, you know, there have been some books on the great influenza and, and um, uh, pandemics, but it's only now that, you know, there's more published and people start paying attention to the history now that it, uh, that it has happened. The same you could exactly see for the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, barely, and even today, I asked that question today, barely any of my younger students remember the 2008 Great Recession, and that's, you know, just about 10 years uh, ago. So the memory is very, very short that we have for history. And even then, uh, it's only then when we had the Great Recession that we actually look back at the Great Depression. Uh, people have forgotten about it, and those, again, who take my classes remember that I always talk about Eva Kroger, who was that villain or hero, wherever you want, uh, was an important part of that Great Depression story. Uh, but again, none of them uh, had ever heard about him before uh, they got my class. So it's, it's these events that make us look back, but we don't remember um, those things, the bad things that happened. Um, and the other thing is, and that's why I put this book there, This Time is Different, which was written after the financial crisis. And they looked at all the financial crises in the past. They uh, found that, you know, there were lots of them, financial crises, bubbles that burst and financial crisis. But what they found most surprising is that each time before a new crisis hit, people said, this time is different meaning this time we won't have a crisis. So it's this constant optimism, believing that you know, it won't hit us again. And obviously it hit again. So it's this optimism that gets people to give money to Argentina, despite its recurring defaults. Um, Argentina is onto its ninth, number nine, ninth default in the last 200 years. 
and people, uh, so that's on average every 20, 25 years that Argentina defaults on its debt and people still give money to it. So um, our memory is short. So, and again, I wanna uh, clearly stress that this is no black swan. We had warnings, uh, we had recurrent flu pandemics. Again, I read an article this morning saying that I think since 1700, we had seven or eight major flu pandemics. The biggest one, obviously, was the great influenza of 2018-19. But we had SARS, you know, and it wasn't quite as lethal. Well, it's lethal, more lethal for individuals, but it was not as infectious. And we had MERS, another, these are two coronaviruses. And again, we thought this time maybe it was different or it wouldn't happen again. But it keeps happening again. So uh, that's the uh, second insight. Third insight, and I'll, I'll get to what I want to say. Third insight is that one thing we recurrently do, so we don't remember, uh, so pandemics recur, uh, we don't remember them, uh, but what we recurrently do in all pandemics is uh, blame somebody. And usually we pin it on some other and very often without factual basis. So during the Middle Ages, during these recurrent appearances of the Black Death, of the plague, uh, you know, the other was actually in the middle of uh, society's then. So there were repeated massacres of Jewish people and uh, during, you know, uh, who were blamed for uh, the Black Death. And the picture here is uh, from a massacre that occurred in Strasbourg in, let me uh, look at it. It occurred in February 14th, 1349, when um, the Jewish, you know, Jewish people who lived in Strasbourg were burnt uh, by the others. And this despite the Pope pointing out that they obviously also suffered the black death, that they weren't immune to it. So uh, it didn't make any sense. So we keep doing that same thing. And today the other is obviously not the, well, it's partially the other in our middle, but it's, uh, it, we see the same thing today. So there's current attempts to blame it on China, people calling it the Chinese or the Wuhan virus, just like, you know, again, Twitter dude uh, blames drug use and crime in the US on the mythical Mexicans. Uh, but you see this even in a country like Canada, and I'm shocked about this. There are some instances of racism against Asians, because most people can't uh, distinguish, most Western people can't distinguish easily between uh, Chinese and other Asians. From the highest political level, and uh, probably those who read about this will know who I talk about, uh, to you know, incidents that get reported in the press uh, and that I hear from friends in hospitals and schools before they were closed down in Toronto, where people didn't want to be close to uh, people of Asian descent, even if they're third generation Canadians, fourth generation Canadians. So uh, it's still there. Um, and there, the fact is, if you actually look at uh, Canadian cases and the statistics, most of those cases are not from China, not from Iran, um, not from any of these bad countries, uh, but they come from the US and the UK. And uh, a lot of them were brought back probably during March break um, in the provinces that didn't stop people going on March break, whereas BC did stop people going on March break and um, as a result had a, low, has a lower incidence of COVID than the other provinces that I just mentioned. Okay. Uh, and again, it's not just the West. Uh, China is also trying to blame it on the US. Um, in terms of the origin, so there is the trade origin stories, and there is some, you know, reluctance towards foreigners, some incidents towards foreigners, especially foreigners that are easily visible. We heard about that, and I think even, you know, some of the comments during uh, Anoop's talks were referring to the Africans who've been invited to China and now are seen as, you know, foreigners and as dangerous foreigners. And, and China, when it reports cases, it talks about imported cases, though most of them are actually Chinese returning uh, to, to home. And Russia is content on pouring oil on the fire uh, through, you know, what it does well um, with, you know, fake news. Um, and they have obviously a lot of oil to spare at the moment. Um, hope you got the joke. And uh, certainly there's, they're sitting in that, uh, you know, um, imaginary glass house at the moment. Maybe should be a little careful before doing that. And again, there's some reports about some in India portraying m Muslims as the vector of the disease. So you have this blame. So it's another recurrent fact. There are some people uh, who think, who want the parallel in history to be the post-war, post-World War II reconstruction period. So there is an article, and I encourage you to read it, by Bill Gates in The Economist, uh, who has this very positive view how the world's going to come together to rebuild the world after COVID. Um, very positive. You know, I, I, I admire his optimism. Um, there's also Angela Merkel in her speeches referring to post-war reconstruction in Germany, post-World War II, because that's been a time that some people in Germany still remember of, you know, the country coming together, rebuilding after a war that Germany started. 
uh, to rebuild uh, the country. And, and, you know, in that period, uh, the US was clearly a liberating and transformative force. Uh, I'll come back to it, exported the New Deal with willing takers to many countries. And I'll come back to the New Deal because that's part of my options of where we could go. And, uh, you know, in that period, there were the foundations for the new global economy uh, laid that are now all under question and all, you know, sort of in doubt. Uh, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, and Anu talked about that, how they're now rival institutions, how they've lost legitimacy in his talk uh, on Tuesday. Uh, but we shouldn't remember that post-war was also a start of a Cold War, where there was the US-led uh, free world versus the USSR-led communist bloc. So you also had the world falling apart into two uh, different blocks. So that's one view. This is, you know, let's rebuild our global economy. Let's redo uh, what we did uh, after World War II. Uh, my view uh, is probably a little more pessimistic, is this is either, you know, post-World War I situation, a post-Great Influenza situation, or the Great Depression, which started with the stock market crash uh, in 29, but got really serious in the early 30s. Um, and my only doubt is, you know, you know, will it be post World War One, and will we have the Roaring Twenties where we let loose for a while after we get a vaccine or some treatment, which was neither of which is is certain. Uh, and again, the Newbury talked about that. That was a period, this period that I'm talking about here, of dismantling the global world order, introduction of patch, uh, protectionism. People, you know, couldn't travel freely any longer like they could before World War One. And again, I just want to make sure that people don't think World War One was the paradise because it's also the, the high time of imperialism and colonialism. And we all kind of know what that means. And But again, it, nationalism was reintroduced in the 1930s and there was a rise of authoritarian militaristic regimes during this period. So, but at the same time, there was the New Deal started by uh, President Franklin Roosevelt in 1933 in the US. And that picture is actually a picture of somebody listening to Roosevelt's fireside chats that he gave over the radio uh, during the New Deal, which was a, a tremendous economic, social, and moral transformation of the US uh, in that period. Um, and you should, and they're publicly available, you can listen to them and should compare them to uh, the press briefings that are given by the current US president um, in terms of the empathy that he portrays and the knowledge of facts and details that uh, Roosevelt portrays in his talk. So uh, what are our options? Well, our ideal option would be probably to get somebody like FDR, uh, public works, you know, government is involved, people will be unemployed. There's lots of things to do uh, in many economies, both in the global north and in the global south. Inequality, social security, rebuild our health system in the countries where it has been dismantled and the countries that did that had to suffer more than others. Build it where there isn't any. Antitrust, uh, you know, that's been an issue and that was a big issue in the 1930s and, you know, um, you know, equality. And why not address climate change? You know, I'm, if I say green, you know, New Deal, I'll get put in a box, but I think that's the challenge of our time and that will cause and is causing uh, lots of death already. They're just more difficult to see and, and measure. So that's on the one hand. The other hand, will we get new Mussolini's, Franco, Stalin, Hitler's? And I don't equate these people um, in terms of, you know, the evil they were, but uh, who will also rebuild the economy. Hitler built the autobahns in Germany while arming the country for war. Uh, and they all stoked ethnic and racial ten tensions and to a certain degrees put others in camps, the others again. And uh, many of them went on to murder them and murder them in huge numbers and commit uh, you know, unnameable crimes. So that's also what happened in the 1930s. So you have the FDR rebuilding a country, um, establishing new moral, economic and social foundation for it. And you've got other people who just go for the other start wars. So uh, what's going to happen? Again, I don't want to predict it. I'm a historian. But uh, I think if you look at how people have dealt with the pandemic, I think the populists did pretty badly um, because, uh, and I call populists those who pretend to care about the people, but only care about themselves. And most of the populists, even today, if you look at the infection numbers, they haven't done a good job. So look at Brazil, uh, look at uh, you know countries, even like Turkey, look at Russia now, look at the US. Um, um, again, I saw some statistic this morning. If you look at the numbers in the US, they're still going up. What makes the curve flatten is that New York's going down, um, which had obviously the biggest outbreak out of all, but the numbers are still increasing. Uh, the curve is flattening because of New York. 
Um, so those who've done well, there's two extremes. Uh, and these are possibly some of the choices we might have. There is one intrusive and oppressive surveillance regime, um, which hit very hard and, um, you know, got it under control after initial hesitation and trying to um, sweep it under carpet. Uh, it did well uh, in terms of getting the disease under control. So you have that. Uh, and you have, and that's my hope, and that's a good sign, you have democracies with empathetic leaders that have also done relatively well. Um, leaders who are empathetic, as I said, and listen to science, and that's important in a time when science has sort of been no longer taken serious in certain parts of the world. And, you know, you know the pictures, uh, you know, the people, Jacinda Ardern, Angela Merkel, um, you have... Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, and even in Japan, you have an interesting contrast, and these are all three women, and in Japan, you have an interesting contrast between the governor of Tokyo, uh, Koike uh, Yuriko, who's a, a woman, and the prime minister, uh, Abe Shinzo, who's a man. Uh, but there's also men who've done good things, so, but as I said, very often it's fallen to, to women. Uh, the president of South Korea, South Korea is an example that many countries should probably follow in terms of uh, testing, uh, tracing, and then, you know, selectively isolating. Uh, because testing and tracing makes that possible. The Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, has done a good job, and maybe more controversially, again, everybody will not agree with that, uh, the chief minister of uh, Kerala State in India, Pinarayi uh, Vijayan, uh, very few people uh, infected or dead in, in Kerala, despite you know this being uh, part of the global south, uh, but with very simple, simple measures. So anyway, uh, looking forward to the future, uh, I'm just going back to George Orwell, who says, and I had to degender uh, this quote, who controls the present controls the past, who controls the past controls the future. So what I'm trying to say is if we want to control the future and make a better future for humankind and for, for everybody, we need to control the present, but then we need to not forget about the past and remember the things that matter. Uh, like, you know, pandemic are part of uh, human existence and uh, let's work on you know, controlling them, developing vaccines uh, before they uh, hit us. Uh, so there's a question from Timothy Ryder, who asks, what changes in your presentation if there is no post-COVID, only living with COVID? Very important question. We don't know uh, whether we will, will, whether COVID will be ending up uh, another flu. Uh, we're used to the flu. So uh, we will accommodate the flu. Maybe there'll be a vaccine that will be partially successful. Most people, you know, we know that the flu vaccine is only partially providing immunity, and most people don't even get it. Uh, and we live with the flu. And some years we have bad flu outbreaks that kill quite a lot of people, and some flu years we don't have. COVID might go into the similar uh, situation, though it's a, a much meaner virus because it will uh, spread more undetected than the flu. Uh, you know, there is, I'm not a doctor, but again, the article said because of the incubation periods and for, because of when people are infectious, uh, COVID can spread. And that's exactly happened in many countries. Uh, definitely, we know that happened in the US and it seems it might have even happened in France. Uh, it, it, the problem is that you get steeper, steeper curve because it will spread undetected and then spike. Okay, so, um, but eventually humans get used to it. So we got used to the flu, we might get used to COVID. Um, absolutely. So uh, the future might be like that. Mm, the future might be there's a treatment. The future might be there's a vaccine. Uh, I don't know. But uh, what I'm saying is it's not going to be the last. The point I'm trying to make is there'll be another COVID. There'll be another flu. There'll be another pandemic. And we're not prepared for that if we don't you know, have the science ready uh, to deal with it. So the question is, what can you share with us about how to study, examine, understand quiet successes from the past? Uh, the biggest success, no, uh, bad things don't happen if people get together. Very simple. Biggest success is smallpox. Um, smallpox used to be, kill it's killed billions throughout human history. Billions, billions, billions. And the world got together, um, the world got together and vanquished it. Um, and we, we actually, it's extinct. There is no more smallpox. Uh, there is, I think, two labs in the world, one in Russia and one in uh, the US. There might be one in China, you never know. But uh, that still have the smallpox, uh, uh, so you could they could release it any any time. Um, but humans got together, so so bad things don't happen if humans get together. Be prepared and try to fight a common a common enemy. And smallpox was a, one of the biggest killers, and we vanquished it. Um, so 
We could do that for tuberculosis. There is no reason why we can't do that for tuberculosis. We could possibly do that for malaria if there was enough money. Well, you know, malaria has killed millions. And tuberculosis, as I said, killed. So there, these things can happen. Um, so it, we should look at those success stories. You're absolutely right, where we actually vanquished and possibly even preempted. It's more difficult uh, to preempt these things. But as I said, these diseases are not black swans. They will happen and they will happen again. So it's better to be prepared. Um, um, but as I said, they, we can also achieve great things. And smallpox has been a great, great victory, an unbelievable victory. And if you just look at some pictures of what, and that's a bad killer. And there's lots of other bad killers that are out there. Um, but mostly we're selfish. Um, and, you know, um, that's, you know, and we're more for selfish now than we used to be maybe even 10, 20 years ago. Uh, there's a question from Rohit Menon who asks, I want to get your perspective on if people are jumping the gun by assuming that this pandemic will permanently change human behavior on multiple fronts. They said the same thing after 9-11 and other disasters. History shows us that we bounce back. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, it's again, I agree. I totally agree. Humans are great. They're great. They're optimistic. They're forward looking. And what I, you know, sort of blame humans for is not sometimes looking back in the past and say, hey, this might happen again. Should we not be a bit better prepared? Oh, look, look in the past, you know, we gave money to Argentina and defaulted. Oh, maybe we should not give money and so on. Sorry for the Argentinians. Uh, you know, some good Argentinian friends. But um, again, um, Humans will bounce back and we will bounce back from COVID. The question is how we bounce back. As I said, if this is, if it rhymes with the interwar period, World War I, Great Depression, that bounce back wasn't a good one. It led to another great disaster and millions being killed by, you know, murderous dictators and, you know, in another tremendous war. However, and again, I am not doing this, but I'm doing this. If you add up the death from both world wars, they don't reach the death toll from the great influenza. And both world wars were terrible and brought terrible suffering. We'd for totally forgotten about the great influenza. We have, and we should remember the wars and try to not have another war. Um, but we will bounce back, absolutely. And, you know, again, people are bouncing back already. And, you know, we, we might live with it, we might find a cure, but what I'm saying is, let's not uh, be as blue-eyed with the next one. But Believe me, I'm convinced we'll be as blue-eyed as we are with, you know, we're with the financial crises. And There's a question from Jose Urda uh, Neta, uh, who says, uh, asks, uh, talking about rhythms, what are your thoughts on additional impact deaths due to depression, family violence, alcoholism that will come, that are a straight correlation to the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, one thing I want to say about all these crises, they exacerbate things that are already there. Uh, you know, um, femicide, uh, women being killed in their family has been a, a scourge in most societies. And it's gotten worse and it will be, once we get the statistics, it will have gotten worse during this pandemic. Uh, so, so pandemics bring out trends that have been there and the same for globalization and deglobalization. It doesn't cause them, it makes them worse. It brings them out. And, and that's, you know, yes, and there's death that come from that. But, um, and, and it, you know, leaders always have to make trade-offs and, and every leader in every country in electing a leader, oh, some countries don't get a chance to elect leaders, but uh, has to sort of know what the trade-offs are that that leader is willing to make. And um, but these choices should be made with science. These choices should be made with knowledge uh, rather than based on gut feeling. So um, as I said, it is very, very important that we have the science, that we have the knowledge to make those choices. And it's, it's terrible. You're totally right. There's lots of uh, additional death that will happen. Like I said, malaria will probably kill twice as many people this year as it killed, kills in normal years because of COVID. So, you know, and again, the choices are made by leaders. And again, I shouldn't say that, but you know, the COVID response is a very north, global north response because we care about our health systems and we're right to care about our health systems not, you know, collapsing. Uh, but the knock-on effects for the global south, you know, today there was an article about global famine uh, are, are very bad. But does that mean we should let people die today? You know, here, uh, you know, people that are in the residences uh, for old age and just, no, you know, these are terrible trade-offs to make. And I think we should try to work together to not have to make them. Um, but as I said, the problems are there. The famine's been there, malaria's there. Uh, femicide uh, in families has, has been there 
So, uh, uh, you know, it just brought it out and made it worse, but they've been there. So let's address them all. You know, mm, climate change will come back. Uh, you know, pollution will come back after COVID. Uh, we still need to address them. Mm. So, so what I'm saying is, you know, let's, you know, this, the, my point is COVID will happen again. So let's be prepared next time. And it's not going to be called COVID. But all the other problems, they're still there, COVID or no COVID. Uh, let's also address them. But we can only do that if we remember our, our humanity that reunites us. And as I said, I was shocked about Canada or some people in Canada forgetting about that um, because, you know, we are supposed to be an example and, and becoming as racist as some other people. There's a question from Charles Chu. Uh, his question is, can it be that remembering in quotes is a function of our ability to, uh, or desire to comparing? In other words, we remember more easily when we want to want or need to compare. I'm not an expert in memory studies. Uh, I think, again, when I give my class, I always talk about selective memory. Uh, and the question is, who selects? Is it us who select or is it the government who selects or somebody else who selects what we remember? Why do we remember World War I, which was terrible? And again, I'm not saying World War I. It was a terrible war and you know, just have to watch you know, 1917 or The Path of Glory, uh, Kirk Douglas, uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick movie, if you haven't seen that one. Uh, it's a terrible war. It's, it's taken a terrible toll and it had effects but we keep remembering that, and for good reasons, but we don't keep remembering the great influenza, which happened more or less at the same time in a shorter period of time, killed more people. And the two together were actually uh, the, the big killer because um, you know, India got affected by the great influenza, largely by those who had fought on, uh, for the British army in, this, in the First World War. Um, and then the Brits didn't have a good health system in India. So India was the country that suffered most, one of the countries that suffered most from the great influenza. Again, all these things are related, but what makes us remember one and not the other? Um, you know, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but you know, um, obviously because you remember wars, you prepare for wars. Uh, and that means you know, peace talks, but it also means armaments. Uh, if we would remember, if you would remember uh, diseases and pandemics, we would invest more in research and in you know vaccines and the other things that prevent this from happening, and health systems that can help us uh, uh, deal with the consequences. So there is a choice, and again, each country and you know each people have to make that choice. Uh, and I think it's important that we have leaders who recognize that choice and put it to their people and say, hey, you know, what is what should be our priority? And maybe it should be both, but you know you have to make these trade-offs. So there's a question regarding the leaders and I think uh, one of your last slides. Uh, so this is from Johnson, Jose Matthew. Uh, the, the current trend is that global leaders are banding together based on their style of leadership. Intrusive and oppressive mm -hmm. surveillance regime versus democracies with empathetic, uh, empathetic leaders. Will this uh, yes. lead to a new Cold War? Uh, I think we're already in a Cold War in many ways. Uh, so as I said, COVID has accelerated it because we need another to blame and that's blame game between China and the US is just accelerating something that's already there. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the three female leaders that I pointed out, um, they're, you know, and I call Germany a small country, forgive my you know, fellow Germans for that. Uh, uh, they're in small countries far apart and, you know, one country isn't even recognized by most other countries and people will say, hey, Taiwan's not a country. Uh, it's a renegade province. But what I'm saying is, you know, uh, we have uh, a Cold War that's not, unfortunately, not between those empathetic, uh, uh, democratic, science-based leaders and the surveillance regimes, but uh, a Cold War where these are people who are on the sidelines. I hope just that their example maybe might inspire other people uh, to elect those who have the choice to elect, uh, elect leaders that are uh, empathetic and science and not populists for their own sake, but really care about their uh, population. It's, it's an image question. So I, they, you know, we won't have a world where is New Zealand, uh, Taiwan and Germany on one hand, and the rest on the other, you won't have that. So the, the big geopolitical conflict is there. It was there before COVID. It's just got accelerated. But I hope that these people provide a, an image uh, of hope and a, a view of thing, how things should be done. And the past also does that. FDR 
you know, um, is, is a great example, you know, empathy. And, and he fought a war. He fought a war for the, you know, he fought a war. And um, again, um, but he also, you know, brought his, you know, changed his country and, and made it a better country. Um, so, uh, as I said, let's look towards these leaders as, as ideal types and try to elect people who are similar to those leaders. So the question uh, is from Omar Surya. Do you think that in the post-COVID world, there'll be more emphasis on improving the healthcare system and keeping a machinery ready for quicker response? And a follow-up question is, will that mean US might shift towards universal single-payer healthcare system like the one in Canada? Yeah, I, as I said, these are questions that are, uh, answer, are to be answered in 30 years. Uh, because I, 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 I don't know. I think people, uh, especially in, in Italy and, uh, and Spain and France, who really had big cuts in their healthcare systems, because partially because the rest of Europe pressured them to bring their public finances into order, will look at that again and there will be more investment. And, you know, there's other countries. You've, if you just the statistics are there, how much you've invested uh, in, in healthcare. Um, and the U.S. should look at it, but the problem is that uh, the people who need it most, um, you know, again, are sort of the same forget forgotten people in the global south. When, as I said, all these diseases that we have, they're in Africa and in the global south, and they happen every year, and we don't really care that much. And in the U.S., again, you look at the statistics, and the people who actually die, uh, the vast majority, uh, are people who are the forgotten half. Um, uh, of the population. Again, I'm not the one to tell the U.S. what to do. Uh, I think U.S. people have a choice and they, it's good they have a choice. They have elections and they also have seen how certain governors dealt with this better than others. And again, and they should have that choice and have that say. And, you know, I'm sure that some form of single health care will be on the table for, you know, in that choice. And, you know, they should make that choice and they should just look to others and see which countries did better and which countries did worse. I'm not going to predict, you know, what choice they will make because there's other things that, you know, people, um, you know, that matter to people and the economy is an important thing. And as I said, this is as much a great depression as it is a pandemic. And we will have to deal with that great depression in a way that doesn't promote more Mussolini's, Franco's, Stalin's and Hitler's. There's a question from Hussein Fadlala. Uh, what is the uh, role of business school in, in, in business schools in institutionalizing remembering in the post COVID world? Yeah, all the business schools should have at least one history professor on their faculty and that history professor should teach every single student in that business school at least once. Uh, so surely we're great because we have that. Actually, our undergrads actually get a, um, get a full course and I will talk to my colleagues who teach that course then we'll probably put something on pandemics into that course going forward, we didn't have it. But uh, I think, uh, yes, we, we have a role to play. We have a role to play also in being critical. Uh, you know, we always forget that because we're measured on output and impact, but part of our job is, and, and again, I wanna, you know, go back to Dirk, Dirk, uh, Dirk Matten's talk at the very beginning, Dirk was courageous enough to start us out here. And he, you know, had a very critical perspective on, on CSR and how some people don't, uh, you know, talk CSR and don't do CSR. And, and again, this, you know, crisis has brought this out. So, so I think we also need to be critical people, just asking questions and, you know, um, but yes, we have a, a, a responsibility to remember. And I said, I'm grateful for Shulik for being here. And I think other business schools should have a history professor and every business student should have somebody who reminds them of, you know, what we've had in history and that that might rhyme in the future. A question from Joshua David. Uh, many health experts are, uh, and people like Bill Gates are warning us that many more pandemics will be hitting the globe very frequently than before. So do you think the bullish growth that we have seen in business and economics across the globe over the past five decades is now a thing of the past? Uh, no, no, again, like, like Anoop said, it's, it comes in waves. So uh, we will, it, it's going down now very clearly and, you know, things will be more nationalistic, very clearly we'll repatriate some manufacturing and so on. But it will expand again because it makes sense. It makes economic sense and, you know, and, and, and that drives a lot of what we do on this globe. So um, it, it'll, it comes in waves and there'll be a wave of retraction, there'll be a wave of expansion. Um, Again, the question is what kind of nationalism will be there, a uh, soft kind of nationalism, and, you know, or will it be going back to those 30s when, which eventually led to World War II, uh, which I hope it won't. So um, it, 
the economy will come back. How long will it take? What economy will it be? We have choices here. And as I said, we have choices to make and let's look at the past and let's try to bring the economy back in a FDR New Deal way. We have that opportunity. You know, we have, you know, uh, the opportunity to do new public works and we have opportunities here, but we also will have people who will keep blaming the other um, to distract from their own failings and not do that. So I, I, you know, I strongly encourage everybody to look at those role models and see what, uh, how we can follow them, how we can rhyme it with the New Deal rather than with, you know, Hitler's outer bounds and Second World Wars and Holocaust. And this question is from Akshay Nikam, who writes, I don't have a question related to today's topic, but I want to know what are some of Professor Kipping's favorite books rec recommended list. <laughs> uh, no, just read a book on the great, there's now several books on the great influenza. That's, you know, uh, 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 learn about those things, you know, uh, something comes to mind, just, just read it. Read those books even while they're not popular. So I, I read a book on the great influenza actually three years ago because of the uh, centennial um, and I hadn't really paid much attention. And then I tried to find more books and I was surprised how I couldn't pick things and there'll be a book on things. There'll be some lone historian who will have written about lots of things. Um, and so, as I said, there is several good books on, on the great influenza. Um, read that and see how people cope then and, and compare that to today uh, and see where you can rhyme. There's books, there's great books on, on the interwar period. There's an interesting book uh, by Adam Tooze about, you know, crashed. It's called, as an historian who compares the, uh, you know, again, our crash with, uh, the 2008 financial crisis with you know past financial crisis. There's some there's some really really uh, great uh, great books. So um, if you have a particular topic, email me. Uh, email me even if you disagree with me. Um, so anyway, I'm I'm always willing to share. And I'm once we're back in in live, I'm always happy to have a coffee. I always say that to my students and have a longer discussion. You learn a lot from talking to people, even if they disagree with you. Uh, I hope you learned something from me, even if you disagreed with me. Uh, I don't expect you to believe, you know, in what I said, and that's sort of my final remarks. Uh, well, I, you know, I try to base it on facts and science and what we know. Um, the important thing, I think, is, you know, that we keep a conversation and we remember our shared humanity. And as I said, it's I'm, I'm glad, grateful that, you know, uh, uh, grateful that, that Rob Phillips asked that question about, you know, we vanquished, yeah, we vanquished uh, uh, smallpox, a big, big killer. And we can do this again. And, and it looks like, you know, and if you read Bill Gates, you know, he's optimistic that we can do it again. I'm more, you know, Professor Doom, but uh, maybe we can do it again if we all, you know, and it depends on the kind of leaders we elect. So let's elect some leaders that, that are up to the empathetic, that are up to the challenge, that believe in science. And uh, so on behalf of everyone, uh, thanks uh, for putting together the presentation and giving very uh, great answers. Uh, so with this, uh, we will, uh, kind of finish our session. I just want to quickly uh, mention that uh, about our upcoming webinar, when we have Professor Eileen Fisher, will be talking about entrepreneurship uh, and especially entrepreneurship in the post pandemic world. So please do join us uh, next Tuesday uh, at, at the same time. And uh, finally, I want to reiterate that uh, we continue to be open. So if you have any questions regarding the seminar series, about admissions, about programs, uh, please uh, connect us through these uh, sites or through the various uh, social media handles. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us and I look forward to Thank you. Uh, having a lot of you join next week.